application we have. So go and download our podcast on Mixcloud so you can listen to what we discuss here and there is a lot more to see. And also please download our application on your iPhone so then you'd be always logged in and then you can see the best stories by Gromatsky. Absolutely. All right, so the first topic we're going to be looking at is Moldova, which does not get a lot of coverage generally. Uh, so you might ask, why are we looking at it now? What is Moldova? What happens there? All of these very burning questions. Uh, Moldova, like Ukraine, is a former Soviet republic, but a little different. Uh, they speak a Romance language, Romanian there, uh, which during the time of the Soviet Union was called Moldovan. There are about three million people who live there. Most of the people are Orthodox, uh, though Christians. Um, so not a huge country, but there have been a lot of protests and that's what we want to look at tonight. And uh, before we go to the Skype from Chisinau uh, and discussing what is without the protest, I just should remind you that there is, it's, just, it's not just today when we're talking about Moldova, but for the last year there was a lot of happening and the, uh, probably the main reason of the protest were the uh, anti-corruption scandal, the scandal of the government which was uh, engaged in the scandal with the banks and with the ruined financial system. Currently in the media you can see really a lot of stories about the fight between pro-Russian and pro-European camp. Our Moldovan colleagues and journalists who really work on the ground really ask and they stress that you should really uh, have a you know, have a, do not uh, find this uh, bipolar attitude because currently uh, during this crisis you have two so-called pro-Russian parties and one pro-European party which are staging the protest uh, together and that's what we know. But, uh, but we would like to talk to uh, Sebastian Gobert who is a, a French journalist uh, based in Kiev but definitely currently covering uh, protests in Moldova, working in the streets. This is a very cold winter in the whole region. So I wonder if um, Sebastian can really explain us what is happening there. Uh, what is happening here? What is, what is happening there? Wh what happened today? You mean Just really explain us here. Yeah, what's happening today uh, in uh, Chisinau and uh, what are the latest news? Okay, well, basically what happened today was a massive demonstration by the three uh, opposition forces. So the three opposition forces, we have the Socialist Party, which is basically, I mean, made of... Uh, Pro-Russian, uh, pro-Russian, sim uh, I mean, Russian sympathizers, and also nostalgics of the of the of the of the Soviet era. Uh, we have populists who definitely are very, uh, very much looking uh, towards uh, association with with Russia, and we also have a pro-European uh, movement, the the the, <coughs> the the platform for dignity and truth. And uh, so all of these uh, parties gathered f just a few days ago on 20th of January when uh, the, the, the new uh, government was voted in in secret at night and it was the third government uh, this year that, that uh, the, the Moldovan parliament uh, elected but it's already accused of corruption because it's representative of the, the, the so-called pro-European coalition, uh, a coalition that has been accused of uh, corruption that has been accused of uh, funds uh, embezzlement that has been accused of uh, enhancing uh, an oligarchic uh, system in, uh, in 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 Moldova. So opposition forces basically gathered strength against uh, this government and they ask for the government to step down, for early elections to be organised, and for a constitutional uh, reform to be voted in. And uh, today was supposed to be quite a big day but they could get something like 10, 15,000 uh, uh, demonstrators in the center of Kishinev, in the center of Kishinev, sorry. Uh, they were mostly coming from the regions. There were not so many demonstrators from Kishinev proper, which also shows that the movement, the protest movement itself is not so popular uh, within the, the Moldovan uh, population. They had a full day of demonstrations uh, which were organized in a very classical way, like political speeches from the main square of the city, and uh, of course, like a lot of uh, calls for uh, you know determination and uh, people to fight until the end. And uh, at some point, they did something which was pretty weird. They they they, they started to walk to the end of the city, and uh, they uh, <coughs> they went there and they blocked one access road to the city for uh, something like one hour which uh, was a kind of a warning that if the government would not step down, 
they would uh, well basically uh, they would basically block block all the access uh, accesses to to the city. When they gave them an ultimatum now, correct? They have till Thursday to yeah. But down? the thing is that they gave an ultimatum before. They gave an ultimatum uh, two days ago, which was not respected, which was not even commented on uh, by the by the government. And so, uh, I mean, we, we see that basically like the three uh, op opposition forces, which are extremely diverse and actually quite, you know, divided and competing with, uh, w between each other, uh, they're not, they don't manage to put forward a clear agenda for change and a clear well, agenda. What's, for what's going on? You know, we've looked, we've talked about corruption. You've had over a billion dollars disappear from banks under suspect circumstances. There's <coughs> talk about the EU and there's talk about Russia. Is this Maidan 2.0? What's the driving force here? No, 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 no. It's definitely not Maidan 2.0 and we <coughs> really, uh, we, we really cannot present it that way. What is happening in Moldova is that, I mean, in that, in that sense, similar to Ukraine, is that uh, we're talking about a captured state, uh, which is a state captured by one oligarch uh, who is named Vlad Plachotniuk, and he's a very, very controversial character for, uh, for quite many years. <clears throat> he has business connections everywhere in Moldova, but also in different countries, Russia, the EU, and so on and so on. Uh, he's said to control the, the gas dealings between Transnistria and, uh, and, 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 and Moldova. So, I mean, like, we're talking about millions of dollars. And basically, he has worked over the past few years to really control every, uh, the, every aspect <clears throat> of the state. So he controls the courts, the, the police, the parliament, the government, and the constitutional court, as we, as we uh, realized just a few days ago. And uh, people are really, really angry about that. He yes, also, yeah. uh, so, something, something that is actually very interesting is that he also controls the media, something like 80% of them. But nevertheless, because of the corruption scandals and because of the abuses and so on and so on, he is the most unpopular uh, personality in, uh, in Moldova. So it's quite a contradiction. At the same time, Sebastian, today you mentioned that the protests were not really popular among the residents of the capital, Chisinau. So why then um, like that? Why it's not a bigger protest? <clears throat> so this is a very important point, and this is also why we cannot compare uh, what is happening now in Chisinau with, uh, with, with Maidan or even with Georgia 10 years ago in that respect. The thing is that uh, because of you know, its geography, its size, its, um, its, its recent developments and so on and so on, Moldova is this tiny country uh, which has a very, very high rate of immigration and actually a lot of people leave from, uh, from Moldova. And the ones who still didn't leave or who came back, they have this possibility to leave. And, uh, you know, because of uh, visa liberalization, because of a tradition of immigration, also because something like 40% of the population holds uh, Romanian passports. And uh, the thing is that people actually don't stick around and stand up for their rights and fight for a better future. The thing is that we are in a political deadlock. The economic crisis is absolutely disastrous. There, I mean, all of the indicators, <clears throat> I'm not going to go through them, but they're <clears throat> extremely, extremely bad. And so for many Moldovans who are something like 20, 25, 30, well, uh, you understand that uh, it, it has been a political crisis for the past five years, six years, and <clears throat> the situation over the time of the independence has not been good either. So many of them just don't spend, waste the time uh, fighting and uh, they don't, uh, they don't take, take it to the streets. And actually the, the age <clears throat> uh, average or today, <clears throat> on the square, on the main square in the city. Well, it was something like around 50 years <laughs> old. It was really people from the regions, rural areas, who basically, you know, if we may call it that way, homo sovieticus, who really lost a lot in the transition and uh, who this time, well, decided to go from the countryside to the, to the capital to, to try to, to, to get some changes. But as I said, we have a lot of organizational problems and a lot, uh, really like some lack of perspectives. Uh, Sebastian, thanks a lot for such a um, great uh, explanation. That's exactly what we need in this case when it's very easy for journalists to uh, explain it in the simple geopolitical way. Uh, and Hromatske had been following the protest and the situation in Moldova for a while. It's a neighboring country, so our correspondents Tatiana Kozereva and Anna Tsegima went there and also talked to the people earlier uh, about what it's all about, what are the grievances, what are the problems, so please watch our own report.
Это не наша елка, это сделано правительством. Это вместо елки, которая должна была стоять. Нет, вот понимаете? она. Вот, вот здесь. Они ее, да, напротив поставили. Что вы привезли? Ничего мы не привезли. Мы увозите? Да, увозим. Нету смысла сейчас оставлять. И ага. холодно, а потом будем возить. Это Прима. один из народных артистов Молдовы. Он Очень был рядом приятно. с нами. Это Александр Казаху. Он народ. Здравствуйте. Ты примавара, прима. А, 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 а вы Я поете, да? Контору Мерджи, а, Дежам, он тоже мерзь, его держал Мальтату. Он и поет, и гитарист. Легенда. Легенда Не снимайте. Страны. А сейчас почему так мало людей, и мы смотрим? Нет, ну, сейчас э, и зима с нами, и с другой стороны, зачем нам держать тут э, артистов, или мы более как-то оптимизировали, или как это э, сделали. Да. Mm -hmm. Мы сняли маленькие э, палатки и оставили, оставили вот эти, где там будут где-то по 6 человек в этих домиках. Ну, нет, не чтобы я встали Ну, эй, сам мы презентали. Здесь ребята здесь ку кушают, да? Кто кушает? Добрый вечер. Здравствуйте. Ну, вот, а -а -а. Компот варим. Ну, что Бог дает. Как бы малость, но тоже хорошая. Это вот военные. Ветераны войны Афганистана вот здесь. Они у нас отвечают за, как, за, за, порядок, за, за порядок, да. Они смотрят, чтобы посторонние люди не приходили. Там, а вот. приходят провокаторы, чтобы например? Есть, конечно. Были с России, кстати, болельщики с футбола есть, тут да? нас обзывали. И там очень Проходит грязные. мимо, есть из России, России выпившие. Которые... Тоже... Приходят так, мы... Из России были эти фанаты от футбола, и здесь была провокация большая. Что делали и как и вы... Ну, задержали, отдали полицию там. Ну, Русских огонь, они типа остаются там. одни, в одиночестве, видите. Отказалась Украина от них, мы отказываемся от них. Они хотят тянуть и нас в свое болото. Ну, люди более-менее уже поняли у нас, что Россия остается болотой, потому что они не хотят сами встать на ноги, стать людьми. Ну, это э, стату мажора Алгарзии по порлу, это, как сказать, дружина. Дружина, войско, 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 войско да? из народа. Ага. Вот. Кухня здесь. Ну, тоже сидят, говорят, здесь штаб, как бы вот. Флаги Евросоюза, да? Да, ну мы же сразу платформа сказала, что мы за Евросоюз, мы не за таможенный союз, потому что нету смысла, я не вижу в нем смысла. Короче, мы, мы идем цивилизованно, без насилий. Угу. И это э, наше, наше большое оружие, это партия, как общественная, общественная организация, платформа. Остается, да, да? остается. Я, я, я лично не, не пойду ни в какие депутаты, ни, uh -huh. ни в министры uh -huh. и так далее. Мы должны, э, мы должны проверять контролер народной партии. Мы будем собирать Конфликт людей, интересов не проверять и, и те, которые мы туда их пошлем. В этих целях мы создали в интернете импликари, пункт медиа, сайт, uh -huh. где кто хочет туда CV, кто хочет попасть в правительство, в новые, в, в эту партию. И, и там дискутируется, там есть форум, комментируется, вот этот отлично. А вот этот и он и зря. Он... Если движение перерастает уже такой, ну, приобретает такой политический окрас и приобретает политическое, то как бы есть ли целесообразность еще как бы, в этом городке? в палатках здесь. Эти палатки больше как символические. Да. Их э, тысячи или, или 20 не имеет значения. Это сим символически, видите, протест мы вышли в этом в, на площади. И, и мы должны сохранить, как сказать, этот, этот штаб, угу. чтобы дальше воевать с ними, пока они не, не, не придем к власти. Народ, народная угу. партия.
All right, so that uh, wraps up our Moldova segment. We'll be right back in just a moment. All right, we're back here. Uh, now we want to take a closer look at Davos, where world leaders have been convening in Switzerland this week to uh, discuss a lot of the major issues challenging the world community. Now we had a special here on Hromadska looking at that. And you can find all of the great material that was prepared for that, videos, tweets, and much more using the hashtag Hromadska Davos. Uh, but we were fortunate enough in that we had our, our own people there as well. Um, and we have them here in the studio tonight to, to discuss that a little bit with us. Of course, I'm talking about our own Natalia Zemenyuk, uh, who in just a moment will you know, give us an idea of what she found most interesting. Because the question really is what comes out of these meetings. You know, Davos is a place where people mix with a lot of ease. They're elbow to elbow with one another. And you get a lot of discussions, uh, both official for the media and people going for lunches and coffees to discuss all of that. Uh, so that's really what we want to hear more about. And uh, whenever Natalia is ready, I think she's ready now. Natalia, what did you yep. find most interesting in Davos? I think that we definitely, um, as um, Romatska, as a media which reports on Eastern Europe and Ukraine, uh, can't really discuss all the Davos. So there were some topics we were focusing, which is definitely the reforms in Ukraine, but also the political part of the story, because there was four hour long meeting between the Ukrainian president, Petro Poroshenko, and Joe Biden, vice president of the United States. It's really way too long for <laughs> such an act you know it's a very very uh, busy event with a lot of uh, meetings so it's uh, Biden playing bad cop again all the journalists yeah you can really probably our colleague can show all the photos which they have uh, from that meeting uh, so uh, there was very little very few information about what was happening there uh, what we found out that there was uh, details of the details of the details mm. the details of the reforms and the details of the conditions according to the Minsk uh, agreement, what should be met. And what was surprising and what was very interesting that um, on Friday, uh, John Kerry, the State Secretary of the United States, have come up with the announcement that uh, it could take just a few months a few months, uh, like four or three or four, uh, and the condition of the Minsk agreement could be met. Mm. And uh, then the probably there should be discussion uh, about the lifting the sanctions. So it's something which is not at all discussed because we know there is a lot which should be done. The first of all, there should be control over the border between Russia and Ukraine. But the process is moving ahead because Poroshenko had said before Minsk wouldn't go into <coughs> 2016. So that seems to be something that oh he's We know that on. the Minsk is going to the 2016. Mm -hmm. It's admitted by the Ukrainian politician, by the Western politicians. So my task as a journalist was really to find out to what extent realistic is that. So mm -hmm. we know that uh, Senator uh, Kerry sometimes um, compared to Vice President Biden and to the other politicians maybe has a bit of better and more optimistic picture than often. So we uh, approach the German and the French diplomats, really, and the journalists and the people who have the sources who could tell us more. So and who did even you find they, most yeah. So the interesting was that we managed to talk to uh, Volkan Ischinger, who uh, had been, who is the chairman of the Munich Security Conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, it happened that he just talked to us right after he had a lunch with John Kerry. So he said he was surprised as well. Uh, and probably what we can guess, the uh, why there is this movement, there is this kind of uh, speeding optimism up. Optimism, you said, right? Uh, this optimism, it's probably because there is a belief in the West that things in Russia are really, really gloomy in mm -hmm. the Russian economy, then probably the Kremlin would be more ready to engage. That because of the economy, right? Because of the economy. Yeah. That's the way how the West sees it. Mm -hmm. uh, while, for instance, we've talked to the Russian journalists and they have a very different picture. They think the Russian side thinks it's vice versa. It's the West who want to engage. So oh there is a kind two of dubiosity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are two different takes away. So um, that's what we <coughs> found out. And I probably would uh, propose to see the short quote of uh, Volkan Ischinger himself, which we discussed a bit earlier about what could happen and how the, uh, to what the, in, in are there any real discussion between Russia and the West could take place?
is uh, Prime Minister Medvedev coming to Munich? Yes. The Russian so Federation is... just announced this, and this is also, from, from my point of view, a positive sign. It means that uh, the Russians know very well that President Poroshenko is coming, that Yatsenyuk is coming, that other uh, uh, leaders from Ukraine are coming, that uh, 35 heads of states are, uh, are coming to uh, Munich. So Russia wishes to participate, not only, as always, by uh, sending the foreign minister, but by making a point. And that would be a different capacity of him? Well, uh, I, I, I think what the Russians told me is that uh, uh, it's not simply the prime minister coming, but he's also coming as representing President Putin. So, good. Okay, we'll good. listen to him. Yeah, okay. he will explain what uh, the Russian position is. And, and Munich is, of course, uh, you know, we, we don't just make a speech. We always have questions. Uh, from an audience which is extremely professional, we will have 70 foreign ministers in the in the room, 50 defense ministers, 30 heads of state, many experts from around the world. They'll ask tough questions, and Medvedev knows this. Uh, so it's good that they are coming and answering questions. We'll see how it goes. All right, so that's not all we have from Davos. Obviously, there are a lot of meetings there going on. Uh, what else did you bring back to so us, Natalia? So the, the other story was how about the sanctions, because that's what something what the uh, State Secretary Kerry has said. So uh, what is important to understand, and that was also confirmed by the Germans and by the French, mm -hmm. that the sanctions are really connected to the, um, uh, to the conditions. Legally, so in the European Union, uh, you can lift the sanction just when the conditions are met. Uh, otherwise, any kind of representative of any country would say, like, but there is no amnesty, or there is no elections, or there is no control over the border. So it's not just a decision of the decision makers, you know, of all these mm -hmm. people, but uh, but really th they are legally like that. So that was a question uh, from uh, we've asked uh, also Carl Bildt, besides the former. F uh, Swedish uh, foreign minister who really, really engaged in that. And another question what I um, try to find out and try to ask is this new development, because previously the uh, assistant to the, uh, the, to the vice president of the United States, Victoria Nuland, had met with, the Ru with the, uh, also the representative of the Russian president, Surkov, and we mm -hmm. don't really, and there, is, there are a lot of rumors everywhere. Is it good or bad? Are the Americans going, you know, somewhere, it's a different and separate discussions, or besides the Normandy Forum, is it for good or is it for worse? So mm -hmm. that's what uh, Karl Bill told to us, that probably it's just a new channel of communication, and we shouldn't find the way to suspect something. Mm. No, so um, with this uh, recent development, uh, with meeting of the Americans with uh, Russian representative like Surkov, what should it mean? Because there are dubious discussions about it. I think it's good that we have a broader involvement. I think it's good that the Americans are involved as well. I mean, we got the French and we got the Germans, that's fine. And I think primarily Berlin has been doing very well. But a stronger American involvement, I think, is in the interest of everyone. Um, and then we had some sort of signs from the Russian side. They're changing the team. Exactly what that means, we don't know yet. And um, at this um, stage, you know, but does it mean that there is any kind of dis, uh, mis not misunderstanding, but that it's not so, con uh, so cor correlated what the Germans and the French are doing and the Americans? I think uh, why it's separated in that way. Well, it is separated because I mean the French and the Germans have been doing the Normandy format, and the Americans haven't been part of it. And uh, but at the same time, the Americans are essential when it comes to maneuvering Moscow in different directions. Uh, there are limits to what the Normandy format can achieve, and a stronger American involvement, I think, is good to support the process. And the final, and h what is the discussion between the European re leaders regarding the sanctions against Russia? I know they were renewed, but uh, still now we're thinking would it last long or people well, just for the time being I don't think there is much of a discussion uh, 
for the simple reason that they were prolonged for six months. And then it's very much dependent upon what happened with sort of the local elections to get a bit of a critical thing, next stage, whether there will be an, an agreement on conditions for local elections that are democratically decent or not. And in awaiting that, there's nothing to discuss. So we're having a bit of a different tone from, say, a year ago. Uh, more talk about economics and a bit of a different situation. I know you've been at Davos for different years and you've seen some of that. I mean, did you feel they're talking about the economy more and that's more in the limelight? Um, if you speak about Ukraine, uh, so there was almost nothing about, besides these you know, separate talks between the uh, politicians, in Davos the whole story was about the economy. Uh, at least from the European, uh, from the Ukrainian politicians, they were, uh, you know, separate events. Uh, sometimes they are taking place. You know, a lot of side events. So mm -hmm. there, um, you know, many important people want to be there and to be present. Uh, so mm -hmm. there were there the Ukrainian um, economy minister, the minister of finance, with whom we talked, and always the main que questions from the European and Western politician was, you know, how is going with the reforms? Um, how much had been done? And I should explain that it was less gloomy than I expected. So there was more. So you're expecting something very <laughs> yeah, gloomy. Yeah, I was going because you know there is a general perception in Ukraine that the reforms are not taking place, mm -hmm. and you know it, it, they are too slow. Um, so there was more concrete questions uh, because definitely the economy and the final ministers were the ones who had been praised, mm -hmm. uh, but the questions were to the general prosecutor office, to the um, to the all the connected to the tax reform and to uh, also to the system of the rule of law. Mm -hmm. So uh, what was very clear, without these results, the next year, uh, nobody would really consider the reform successful if those other things wouldn't be met. But we also talked to the Ukrainian Minister for Finance, Natalie Yuresko, asked her about the... Uh, future I'm a, a new IMF loan and also about debt uh, to Russia and a bit more. So in general, tension around the Ukrainian tax, new tax code and the tax reform, what is the deadline and how does you plan to fight this political pressure? Which is uh, there's no deadline in particular for tax reform. Um, what we have done is already incorporated the most critical issues from my perspective, or most of the critical issues, in the adoption of the budget last year. So we were able to reduce the social payroll tax from 41 to 22. That's a very big part of deshadowization in my mind. Um, number two, we were able to reduce the royalties for gas extraction and encourage domestic investment, investment in domestic gas development. Number three, we were able to eliminate advanced corporate tax payments, which has been a, a very difficult thing for Ukrainian businesses, um, and increase excise duties, which was necessary. They hadn't been increased in line with inflation even, let alone with our European Union um, requirements, and, and so on and so on. So there was a whole long series of things that we've already done. Um, and, and in my mind right now, and I think most Ukrainian business would agree, most Ukrainian population would agree, the key issue is the tax administration. So our focus needs to be on reforming uh, the tax administration and customs administration. And that can be done without additional, for the most part, without additional legislation. It just needs to be done step by step, stage by stage. We need to reform the large taxpayer office. We need to change people. In essence, we need to do the same thing we did with the national police. We need to raise the bar. We need to establish different values. We need to establish a different scope for, of, of, of their work, and then we need to, to hire people, uh, open it to everyone, but hire people who can meet those values and the, that scope of work and start, and start refreshing step by step. We've already uh, shrunken the tax service uh, by 30%, about 17,000 people last year. We've already put a proposal to the European Union and our other partners to help us bring in more technology into the state fiscal service, because the more technology we have, the fewer people we have, the fewer human contact, the more automatic contact, the less room there is, again, less space for corruption. So all those things are underway. We're also working to, uh, in the next uh, shortest time, uh, issue a tender for part of the customs to be uh, out outsourced and, and be managed, a part of it, uh, by some Western international firm that can bring, again, expertise and bring a high level of standards by which we can then transform all of customs. So there's a lot in motion. Um, but I think that's really critical, and that's the most critical thing in quote-unquote tax reform. It's not about a piece of paper. It's about real change.
So, and General, um, just um, you hear you often representing Ukraine, and there are still a lot of the corruption scandals regarding the Ukrainian, uh, not just exactly the government, but the p political establishment. So, what are your answers to the investors on that when they are asking? Well, I think it's very sad that we still have these corruption scandals. We'd all like them to be put behind us. But I think my answer is to focus on what we have done to eliminate corruption, both, again, in the tax code, but not only in the tax code, what we've done to eliminate the space for corruption. That's the transparency. That's putting Treasury online. It's putting data registers online. It's, it's doing e-procurement. And then third, um, what we're doing to prosecute and what, establish, what, what institutions have been established, which of them are actually functioning, not established on paper, but fully financed at Western levels, already having hired 70, 80 detectives, already prosecuting cases. In the end, really critical for Ukraine to have serious long-term reform is going to be judicial system. Without seriously independent, fair, and free courts, you never can get to the end of this. So you need to have uh, the carrot, which is policy change, but you need the stick, which is fear that you'll go to jail if you break the law. Any, any rule of law society understands that. So I ask investors to be patient, but to look at what's actually happening and to see that those improvements are greater in the last 14, 18 months than they've been in the last 23 years. And on that basis, I ask them to, to believe in Ukraine and the opportunities in Ukraine, I think, are much greater than the risks. And the final on the IMF uh, loan, the next loan, when we can expect it? Uh, we had a very good and successful meeting with the IMF managing director and our president yesterday. We're working out the final details in the text of the memorandum, which is necessary for the second review. And I believe that second review could be uh, within the next few weeks. Hopefully, uh, they have, it hasn't been scheduled yet, but hopefully we'll be able to see the next tranche uh, by the end of February. So, I mean, <laughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, we're hearing more about concrete economic reforms, but there's still also a lot of talk about the role of the EU, especially with this announcement that visa free travel is expected for Ukraine coming this year. I mean, at Davos, what were you hearing from representatives of the EU? What were they saying? Uh, we shortly talked to Jose Manuel Barroso, the former uh, president of the European Commission, uh, and more or less it was the, the same tone. It's uh, really, I mean, they, I would say, use uh, the explain that Ukraine could and should use more of the uh, opportunities the signing of the EU-Ukraine agreement uh, uh, could bring, but definitely it's more about, you know, the whole thing, and it's al always connected to Russia anyway, that the bad thing for Ukraine is not really to look how bad things are in Russia, um, but really help? to do, the, it doesn't help, oh. but really to show, uh, b because, because in fact the Kremlin makes it possible for the local audience explain it's all about the Western sa sanctions. It's not because we are governing in a poor wa and corrupt way, uh, but really to use all this uh, support which is there for the reforms, but clearly for the rule of law reforms, mm -hmm. for the independent and transparent uh, tax uh, administration and also going out and lifting, you know, not taking away all the offshores and things like that. So that would be the most important. And that's probably what we heard from the already former, but still the former, the president of the European Commission, who've been, um, been involved in the Ukraine for the last years. That's <laughs>I think uh, uh, very important reforms uh, have been going on. And I really want to congratulate the Ukrainian authorities uh, for its commitment. I think this government is certainly the government that has made more reforms in Ukrainian history. Uh, having said that, I think that particularly on the fight against corruption, more has to be done. I know that the overall perception of the Ukrainian people is that uh, things are not happening there. Uh, it's not completely true. The government uh, indeed made some changes in systemic matters that were important and they are going to limit the possibilities of, of, of corruption in the future. For instance, some reforms in the energy sector. That was good. But I think the work will not be complete before there are some concrete results. For instance, people that are committing crimes of corruption that we see them subject to trial. And if the the, the evidence is confirmed to prison. Uh, uh, there is an overall sentiment uh, in the Ukraine of impunity, that you can do these things and afterwards you, 
you you become very rich and uh, uh, things go uh, as far as as well as possible for them no that's why it is important to put in place and to make it work the authority against corruption that's why it's important to make the reform of judiciary to make also the uh, more effective attorney general system uh, and it's particularly important the tax administration reform tax and customs it's critically important to have a credible independent tax administration because that's the best way to fight the shadow economy uh, and also for the people to understand no everybody pays its fair part or share of taxes uh, i know the government is committed to do that people in the government they recognize when you speak with them that there are some resistance uh, but uh, i think that's the crunch point for for ukraine and now we have that historic moment that it is the adoption and now the entry into force of the dcfta with deep and comprehensive free trade area with the european union so this is not only about economy it's an opportunity for the ukrainian society to make that reform to be fully integrated economically with the european union and i think that's possible to happen so this year is critically important to see if uh, the progress that was achieved so far can be continued uh, and i believe more can be done in the fight against corruption what we hear also is that after some time there is a willingness of the European business and the governments to take away, to lift the sanctions against Russia because how it, you know, people want to uh, be back to the business as usual. What is your feeling and what is your knowledge about is this mood there? Mm. I think it's important um, that European Union keeps its commitments towards Ukraine. Uh, of course, we would like I also would like to see normal relations with Russia. But normal relations not at any price. For instance, the respect of the Minsk agreement is critically important. So what is important now for the European Union, and I said it just today in this conference, and also I've been saying it to my colleagues in the European Union because I keep very close contacts with them, is not to give a lower priority to Ukraine. Because of the refugee crisis, because of the, the eyes of the European Union now are more turned to Syria, to the international terrorism, there is a risk that the Ukrainian issue goes down in the agenda of Europe. And that would be a mistake. Not only it would be bad for the Ukrainian people, but it would be bad also for Europe, because the Ukraine's stability is of the overall strategic interest for Europe. If Europe uh, does not respect the commitments taken with Ukraine, in that case, we may have other pr Ukraines in other parts of Europe. And that's why I, I'm so, so clear about this. Um, and uh, there is, of course, a debate going on in Europe on, on that. Uh, and that's also why it's important that Ukraine makes the reforms, you see. Because if not, uh, if, uh, if Ukraine does not appear attractive to the European uh, community, European business and so on, they will say, okay, Ukraine is a lost case, let's work with Russia. And I think, of course, it will be great if we can have normal relations with Russia, but not forgetting our commitments to Ukraine. What you need about what you need to know about the Polish constitutional and political crisis, here we are to explain for you. We have here our colleague Janna Bespianchuk, who just uh, come back from Poland, and especially for her Matka, he tr she tried to find out with our team uh, what's really going on. So hi, uh, Janna. Hello. And we really uh, uh, would like you to introduce your report, really what we would see, because that's probably would be the starting point to discuss. As you know, Poland is now also in the news because we talk a lot about the threat to the Polish democracy. Uh, okay, uh, we tried to um, talk to both sides of the current uh, political crisis in Poland. Uh, to the representatives of for the um, governing party uh, law and justice and also to those people who today protest very actively against uh, the policies that are pursued by uh, this party that is in government right now in Poland. Also what are these policies? What are they so, but that's probably we would watch yeah, and, and then... Yeah, one more point that we also went outside Warsaw to talk to people there because the social base of for uh, the party uh, law and justice is uh, to great extent uh, concentrated, located outside uh, the capital. So we can have a look. 
So um, I suggest we have a look at this, uh, our own Romatica report, and then we will discuss. At the end of a long day, activists from the Committee for the Defence of Democracy gather to discuss the future of Polish democracy. Committee activists are trying to disassociate themselves from all politicians. At this point, the committee doesn't have an office, nor is it officially registered as an organisation. The committee has organised dozens of protests in different cities since the Law and Justice Party came to power. They have more than 100,000 followers on their Facebook page, but their everyday team consists of just seven people. People started to follow us on Facebook in such large numbers because they were reacting to what our government was doing. We didn't expect anything like it. We just wanted to show that we disagree with the way the country is being governed. Every day, dozens of journalists from all around the world are coming to the committee leaders. All of them have the same questions. What's going to happen to democracy in Poland? What's going to happen to the Constitutional Court, public media, internet access? 38% of Polish citizens support the Law and Justice Party, which is still working intensely to change everything about our society. The most amazing thing is that Law and Justice didn't win the election thanks to its core conservative electorate. The party won nearly every voting group, the young, the old, rural towns, even some cities. Of course, the village is still their largest support group. Sobolev village is two hours from Warsaw by train. Nearly 70% of local voters supported law and justice. The local leader of the Sobolev municipality tries to explain their popularity, saying that people were responding to the promise of monthly child support payments from the state. Previously, you'd only receive a thousand zloty when the child was born. Law and justice went farther. They agreed to pay 500 zloty monthly per child. That's 6,000 zloty per year. For low-income Polish families, that's a considerable amount of money. In Sobolev, law and justice's advantage was undeniable. In Warsaw, their impact was minimal. The party received eight seats here, while civic platform won seven. Law and justice leader Yaroslav Kaczynski never wins a majority at the Warsaw polling station in the firefighter school where he votes. The key to understanding what's going on in Polish politics is Yaroslav Kaczynski's personality. We have a government, we have a president, but he is pulling the strings, a man, a man without any constitutional responsibility. Kamil Dombrova is almost neighbours with Yaroslav Kaczynski. This is where Yaroslav Kaczynski lives. You can't see any security. He has a bodyguard, though. Let's have a look at the house from the street. For Polish politicians, it's untraditional to show your wealth. Generally, they aren't that rich. That's the difference between Polish and Russian or Ukrainian politicians. Maybe there's somebody now in the security room. The new government is the new leader of state-controlled TV. It's not a new story for Poland. Directors, editors, hosts were changed after the arrival of the civic platform and law and justice. At this time, dozens of top journalists don't fit into the new reality. The parliament even changed the law on public media. Now journalists can be fired by the finance minister. What is white to one side becomes black for another. In my opinion, the question is whether the government is taking over public media and turning it into propaganda. With the Constitutional Tribunal decision, the law and civil service, permission to monitor people on the internet, it looks like democracy, but these are elements of an undemocratic system. I get the impression that both Western media and Eastern media care about the terrible situation in Poland. As a Poland, as a journalist, I want to assure you that it is not. Nothing will threaten Polish democracy. All right, Jana, that's a very interesting report. Uh, we have some different opinions that are presented there. But I mean, what's your take? When people talk about Polish democracy being under threat, wh where is that coming from? <coughs> Okay, I, I would say that uh, uh, there are a few points. Uh, first of all, uh, it's very necessary to understand that for the current moment, uh, Poland, Polish society is uh, divided to a certain extent from uh, inside because um, like you have one part of for journalists, experts and uh, population that say that the democracy is threatened. 
And the other part says uh, that it's more liberal, more pro-European, more like uh, freedom-minded. Say no, or um, uh, the other part says that everything is good. But when they're so saying democracy is threatened, they mean specifically state-owned media, correct? Yeah, and, uh, including uh, state uh, freedom of media, but also the uh, constitutional uh, court of, mm -hmm. the po of Poland, and uh, also the freedom in internet. And uh, um, also the mm, freedom, uh, I would say the independence of the public officials because they pass the law in public, uh, uh, public uh, state service. And I would say that um, like uh, what is the problem, the, the key problem of for Poland is that uh, the new party, it, it not just the law and justice party, or which yeah, the law the and party. justice party, the governing party uh, that came to power a few months ago. It uh, not just uh, reshuffles or uh, the state, uh, the public institutions, the teams in public institutions. It changes the fundamentals of the laws that regulate these public institutions. Mm -hmm. So this is the key point, and that that is the reason I would say why a certain part of the society is so much concerned with the state of democracy and why the European Union is concerned, uh, concerned with the state of democracy. But I would underline that the society is very much divided and what is black for one side is white for the other side. That is really very interesting phenomenon. And uh, my, we can see the uh, pictures of the demonstration which are taking place uh, pretty often, not every Saturday, but very often uh, against the current government policies. But what is way forward? You know, it's a very recent result of the election. It's just like a bit more than a month th since this conservative party is in power. Uh, so what the, let's say, opposition would do with that? Uh, are there any discussion? Because the next elections would be not really very soon. Mm -hmm. So what all this public debate is about? We are protesting, we are protesting against, but what are the demands? Mm -hmm. uh, first, um, the demand is that uh, the uh, governing party has to talk with the opposition and with the civil society that is uh, represented now by a number of civil in uh, platforms and initiatives that uh, take to the streets that really are able to uh, mobilize people. So they want to have some kind of new round table in Poland, maybe not of this uh, historical scale that took place uh, over 25 years ago, but uh, the kind of round table. And also they appealed to the European Union. But it seems like one of the big questions that's being put forward here is the question of accountability. You know, usually the state is accountable to the people, but via the courts and via the media. And through these laws, which were pushed very actively at the beginning, it seems like there was a plan for that. It seems to be trying to make the media and the courts really much more beholden to the government. Yeah, correct. I think this is uh, uh, the most striking point that is uh, um, stressed by uh, experts uh, in Poland and uh, outside Poland uh, either. So um, what they try to do, they uh, actually, to a certain extent, destroy the um, system of checks and balances inside the, 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 uh, the democracy. So uh, the, there was quite well-developed system of checks and balances when it came to the appointments of uh, the chiefs of for public television and radio. There was the same system for the constitutional court, and now they change uh, all these altogether. And actually, two first things that are being changed by uh, the ruling, the governing party, law and justice are really courts and public media, two basic uh, institutions that um, uh, guarantee assure the accountability and horizontal uh, uh, horizontal checks on the power. That's true. Okay, Jana, thanks a lot. And uh, we really here to confirm that Romanski International is about explaining Eastern European geopolitical storm. And we'll follow Poland and all the other countries and the societies near uh, in order to understand what's happening in the region. Thanks a lot for that. We'll be right back. They have been living together for half a century. She is ill and can't walk, while uh, he still speaks very gently and uh, very incredibly about her. This is the love story from the front line, a story about an elderly couple which is just really in front of everything in the 
small town Krasnohorivka, just really near Donetsk. And uh, Hromadsky reporters had been there and filmed this uh, incredible story uh, with the people living within the war, just with the war behind the door. And uh, please watch this, and it will bring your face, your faith to love. Как она строились, жить стали хорошо, все пошло, дети, семья, все. И вот никогда не думали, что так. Бог мне дал очень хорошую жизнь, жену и очень хорошую семью. У них очень хорошие братья, сестры. Пошли. А это чужой дом, это мы попросили, что тут и живем. Вот тут вроде стреляет, так не попадает, а там попадает. Там девятиэтажные разбили, там, в общем, наделали дело хорошо. И те стреляли, эти стреляли, бог не знает, кто прав, кто виноват. Все братья, все свои. Вроде прекратили, а бах, все равно. У нашего тут нет ничего. У нас тут это все чужое, нас пустили просто в честь беды нашей. Ту лапу давай. Давай это. Ой-ой-ой-ой-ой. А еще хочешь на столок со мной идти? Куда идти? Такой грязюкой. Все, подожди, вытру. Как на зло света нет, ни телевизор не посмотрит, ничего. Я не мажу украинского канала, это очень плохо. Мы что, украинцы или кто? Мы что ли хочем посмотреть, что там в Киеве творится, что к чему? Никто же не показывает. Одна растения Путин и Путин и все. Кому верить? Неизвестно. Все в порядке. Заходи. Дедушка, ну немножко сыграй темную ночь. Так я много не буду играть, конечно. Не за это. Если немножко, так это целый день будет. Я как приехала сама с села, дедушка, познакомились на танцах, и вот как поженился, уже 58 лет живем, пришла постригаться с сестрой, а он там тоже постригался, и вроде моей сестре говорит, что это, она говорит, это моя сестра, ну, не знаю, что он ей сказал, а пошли вечером на танцы. Иду, прохожу парикмахерский, когда идет красавица. Я говорю, вот это будет моей жены. Один мужик говорит, ну, Алексей, посмотрим, посмотрим. На перерыве подошел к ней и сказал, что будете моей жены. Но я вас вот не знаю. Ну, взял гитарку, пошли там, поиграли сюда. И... Ну, я и так, он мне вроде понравился, думаю, ну, и поехала, что село. А тогда ж не автобусы, ничего не ходили. Не могу днем и ночью. В глазах все, хоть пропади. Ну, поехал по луку. Отсюда, по знает куда. Взял гитар, не знаю даже, где живет. Фамилия не знаю. Думаю, куда же идти? Гитарист, у меня же альбом был такой, песни. 
Ну да, смотри, идет своей подругой, со сестрой. Хуя, Бог дал. Бог, жуда такая. Он пешком ходил ко мне сколько лет. А тогда поженились. Так и живем уже. С 58 -го года. Только настроились, жить стали хорошо, все пошло, дети, семья, все. И вот, никогда не думали, что так не поймем, что к чему. И там свои, тут свои, кого защищать, непонятно. Я же офицер. Бог мне дал очень хорошую жизнь, жену и очень хорошую семью. У них очень хорошие братья, сестры. Ты, наверное, уже две батарейки испортил. All right, now we want to take a look at another important topic in Ukraine that we can't get enough of, which is the new patrol police. Uh, we have an infographic we'll pull up in just a second to give you an idea of where they are in Ukraine. So you can see where they aren't already, they're opening up, and if not, they have applicants and they're preparing to launch. It's not just a big story, it's more, mm, I would say, popular and trendy story because it's something you really can watch. Mm -hmm. And uh, beside that, uh, also the people who enforce that they're extremely popular and it's not that easy to get them. So we're very happy to ask our questions and very clear questions to the uh, chief of the Kyiv police, uh, Hatia Dekanaidze, who is a former Georgian Minister of Education and Science, but now she has a totally different job and our own Angelina Karyakina has talked to her and asked the questions we all have. Uh, Hatia, thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. Thank you for inviting me. Um, the first question would be about the differences between uh, what you did in Georgia and between the reforms uh, that went through in Georgia and in Ukraine. There are lots of uh, similarities when we're talking about these reforms, but uh, it's, qu it's quite obvious that these countries are very different and the challenges are really different. First of them is the, the number of the policemen even here in Ukraine. What would you say about the differences and the challenges when we're talking uh, about Georgia and Ukraine? This is a question I've been as asking all the time to myself also. So, so what's the main difference? And actually, I don't really much um, uh, like the question because, you know, just Georgian reform, Ukrainian reform, because Georgia is a unique country and Ukraine is a unique country. Because, because we have, I mean, as in countries, I mean, we as Ukraine and Georgians, we absolutely different mentalities and, of course, scales, you know, geography, because we just huge. So there's a different um, approach. Yeah, absolutely there's a different approach because uh, I, I can say and I must say that, uh, first of all, there are no copy-paste reforms. There are no copy-paste before reforms because because we can't copy one reform and paste to, to another mm -hmm. country, this reform to another country, because we have to be very careful about the mentality, about the... Uh, about the situation about the uh, history about the past about the about the presence you know just that we have to to be very careful you know and that the uh, looks for the different you know direction so sure. first of all but but i can say that uh, there are some similarities because so first of all reforms are always sensitive why why because you know just uh, they, they they are painful sometimes they are sensitive and uh, they're important and their important and the reform of the national police not reform you know just uh, I, can, I have to correct myself is like the establishing of the national police of ukraine is uh, i think that is a number one priority for the country because police is a backbone for the security internal mm -hmm. and external security for uh, for the country it's important for the country to have very strong stable professional and fair police so i think that uh, step by step Yes, just uh, copying some experience. Yes, just uh, talking to the people. Yes, uh, asking some uh, advices to our partners and strategic partners. I think I think that the step step by step, just that we will be heading to our our just that the main goal. Mm -hmm. I was asking about the numbers because there is a concern that those huge numbers of policemen who might not go through or um, let's say succeed uh, in reattestation 
whether the economy or whether the country or society is ready to take those people back into society, whether they will find themselves there. Uh, is, it, is, it a, is it a huge concern? Is it a serious concern? Should we take uh, this into let's account? Let's say in this way that I don't see these people in the rich zone, right? Because mm -hmm. they are not poor people. They are quite rich people. So, And they're the people who are kind of selfish because, you know, just what they did. They did that, uh, uh, they, they did like, you know, just very bad stuff because they changed their life and, they, you know, that their priority was like just to gain and not to be professionals and of course mm -hmm. not to be fair. So, um, but uh, secondly, I can say that um, uh, the main problem, not main problem, but the main priority in the task for us will be to change the mentality and to reshuffle the mentality of the police officers, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, militia officers who used, who will be appointed on the uh, permanent vacancies mm -hmm. at the National Police of Ukraine to change the mentality. Probably, maybe the person had some problems or uh, mistakes or he used to just uh, think and work in other way because you know that he was a part or she was a part of the system which was corrupted which was bad and which was like you know just acting the way it was acting you know so uh, but the main task for us is that the, to create the new structure a new concept of the modern police officer who will be mm -hmm. caring about people who will be oriented on the community and who will be the core of the community Poly, um, community policing in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, if we will be, mm, uh, you know, just doing right stuff, I mean, but, well, with problems, with, with some mistakes, but right stuff, I think that uh, we can create the universal police officer with different mind. Mm -hmm. So what will, what happened with the patrol police officers? You know, what is a main difference between the poli patrol police officers and the DAI, if you ask, if you ask a, a just ordinary person in the street, the main difference is that they are just not bribed, you know? Mm -hmm. They are just not taking money. And uh, by the way, we had a wonderful, um, not wonderful, how to say, just for me it's wonderful, but we had a very good example in Odessa when patrol police officer was asked to be bribed, but he said that no, and he arrested the man who was just trying to bribe him. You, can mm -hmm. you imagine? Can you imagine it's happening with a person and, you know, no, it's a wonderful diet. story for me so too. So yeah. we have to create a different mm -hmm. concept and the format and the frames of the patrol uh, of the uh, police officer. I mean, working in the MPU. Is it? Uh, I think it's one of the main questions among um, ourselves as well, because we, as a part of society, are also closely watching these reforms happening. Uh, is it possible to create a transparent structure in a? highly corrupted system overall, uh, while those new officers with new mentality, as you say, know and fully aware of the corruption on the high levels, and they know that it is still there and it is still happening. Is it, is it possible to create something like that in a in an overall corrupt system? Everything is possible. You know, there is, uh, when we're talking about the possibilities, you know, the, I think that the human being is, a, is the most perfect creature on the earth, you know, with a lot of possibilities. So I think that uh, we can make it. We can make it because, you know, just the first of all, we have to create a very transparent and open, you know, society within the national police of Ukraine. So thus, uh, the police can become, how to say, the first train in the row for the country. Mm -hmm. Train. Mm -hmm pointing that, uh, okay, this training is, you know, just made a big, the huge breakthrough, so we can be here, so we can just follow them. I mean, I think that uh, this example will be like the, I think it's, it is a role model for me, and I think that the NPU must be the role model for other mm -hmm. others. The new year is there already. What do you think are the main challenges for you as the head of the National Police in the upcoming year? Well, we will have a lot of challenges and uh, I don't have some intentions that everything will be smooth mm -hmm. because uh, first of all, we have to do the very crucial reforms and I think that, you know, I think, but it's it's important to say frankly and honestly that, you know, the 2016 will be crucial. 
for the NPU, for uh, creating the stable situation in the country, create the good concept of the police officers just with good salaries, good equipment, you know, well equipped, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. with good cars, gasoline and everything. You know, this is a complex we have to think about. And this is a, this is a complex that we have to uh, provide to the police officers in terms of to just demand and request the highest standards, as I said, you know, in the previous interview. So I think that, uh, yes, there are challenges. I think that uh, there, are mis there will be mistakes, there will be problems. But if you ask me that the why you are so you are confident that everything will be okay, you know, I'm always confident. I'm always confident because we don't have any other way back. We don't have it. Mm -hmm. So uh, all the time, I know for um, starting my service at the, the, the government of Georgia and, you know, just continuing my service in Ukraine. So there are our countries and there is our country, Ukraine, behind our back. So we can't step up. Mm -hmm. So that's my point. But and we're, we're very sure just I don't, to I don't, I don't to be, you know, just I don't want to be very pathetic, but I think, you know, the talking about the future and talking about, about the future of our kids and our country, I think that, uh, you know, I have a right to be emotional. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, that brings us to the end of our show. But as always, we have a special treat for you at the end. We have a video that one of our own correspondents shot uh, right from near the border or the dividing line in Donetsk region for the Festival of the Epiphany. Now, this is the one everyone knows from photos of Slavic men and women wearing small bathing suits jumping into freezing cold water. So this will be an exciting one. Yeah, that's about uh, Mariupol, the mm. city we usually uh, know more about, uh, you know, worse things uh, taking place place so that's all for this week and uh, please follow Hromatske at all the social network it's just a part of uh, Hromatske International and we say goodbye good night <laughs>